This video was made possible by Tab for a Cause. Raise money for charity just by opening tabs, which you were going to do anyway. Link in the description. It sounds like the synopsis for an episode of Law & Order SVU. A billionaire financier is arrested for human trafficking in New York after the FBI uncovers evidence that he lured underage girls to his house where they were molested, assaulted, and worse by the billionaire and his famous pals. The public is shocked that the billionaire was investigated for the same conduct 15 years ago and got away with everything. The billionaire happens to have a little black book containing the contact information for the most powerful people in America, including former and current presidents. This is not, in fact, an episode of SVU. This is real life. Let's look into the multiple prosecutions of Jeffrey Epstein. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer. And today we are gonna talk about Jeffrey Epstein, who is under indictment again for potential sex trafficking. Jeffrey Epstein is a billionaire financier who is friends and associates with several rich and powerful people, including President Donald Trump, who once called Epstein a quote, terrific guy who likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side. Epstein has been investigated repeatedly for trafficking in children who were then forced to have sex with Epstein and his famous friends. There's evidence that the president may have known about or have seen red flags associated with Epstein and that President Trump's now former labor secretary helped cover up some of these crimes. Now, before I go too much further, a quick disclaimer about indictments versus convictions. It is far too easy to assume that someone who is indicted of a crime is guilty of the underlying offense. Too often, that is not the case. And everyone in America is entitled to a fair hearing. So we should look at facts as they are disclosed to the public with a grain of salt and with skepticism. Here, there is both a pending indictment Indictment, as well as a plea deal that covered at least some of this alleged conduct. So there's less of a potential issue in this particular case because some of the facts have been admitted to, but it's still important to recognize that people who have been indicted are not guilty until proven beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. So with that understanding, let's first define what we mean by human sex trafficking. The Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act of 2015, or JVTA, defines sex trafficking as recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of an individual through the means of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of commercial sex. However, it is not necessary to demonstrate force, fraud, or coercion in sex trafficking cases involving children under the age of 18. The term Commercial Sex Act is defined as any sex act on account of which anything of value is given or received by any person. It is illegal to have sex with someone who is underage. I probably don't need to explain that, but in this day and age, it's better to be safe than sorry. So keep that in mind when you hear some of the defenses that refer to uh, allegations of consent. Children cannot consent to the acts that Epstein has allegedly committed. So the allegations and admissions relevant here uh, are broken up into two phases. The first is in the early 2000s. In 2005, a 14 year old girl and her parents told Palm Beach, Florida police detectives that Jeffrey Epstein had paid her and a classmate for sex. The Palm Beach Police Department started investigating Epstein for soliciting underage girls for prostitution. They alleged that Epstein's two assistants, Haley Robson and Sarah Kellen, would recruit teenage girls to give Epstein massages in the bedroom of his Palm Beach mansion. Once inside the house, Epstein would order the girls to strip naked and he would assault them during and after the massage. The Palm Beach police did trash pulls where they went through his garbage and found trash with the girls' names and cell phone numbers on it. Epstein's assistant actually telephoned one of the victims while she was talking to police. As the police investigation continued, more victims were identified. The police promptly issued a probable cause affidavit, which normally is all that's needed to arrest a person in Florida. But in a highly unusual move, the district attorney's office referred the charges to a grand jury instead. The local prosecutors only presented evidence that Epstein assaulted one of the girls and they failed to ask the jury to indict Epstein for having sex with a minor. Instead, Epstein was indicted for solicitation of prostitution, which is a much less serious charge. Epstein's legal team swooped in to negotiate a plea deal that would have allowed Epstein to enter into a pretrial diversion program and serve no jail time. In other words, the local prosecutors were being pressured to just give Epstein a slap on the wrist. The Palm Beach police were not happy with this negotiation and they referred the case to the FBI, which opened a case file on Epstein for activities with underage victims in Florida, New York, and New Mexico. A 53 page federal indictment was prepared but not filed with the Florida District Court. At the same time, Epstein's lawyers were negotiating a plea deal with the US attorney in Miami 
Alex Acosta, who later became President Trump's labor secretary. At the time, Epstein's lawyers included Alan Dershowitz and Ken Starr, among other legal stalwarts. Dershowitz is most famous for defending O.J. Simpson, while Starr was the independent prosecutor who investigated Bill Clinton for having an affair with Monica Lewinsky. Later, Starr became president and chancellor at Baylor University. Allegedly, during the negotiation, Starr was working overtime for Epstein. Starr told Alex Acosta, again, the U.S. attorney for Miami at the time, that his client would not agree to being classified as a sex offender, which is normally mandatory for anyone convicted of a sex offense. Starr also objected to an addendum to the agreement that said that the victims would be able to sue for compensation. Starr worked his connections in the Department of Justice to request a review of the agreement. The review went on for more than a year, and during this time, the FBI continued to investigate, turning up more victims and more evidence against Epstein. The FBI's new allegations included information showing that Epstein preyed on runaways as young as 13 years old, paying them for nude massages that led to sex. The investigation apparently revealed how Epstein preyed on poor children, using his assistance to find vulnerable teen girls who they then paid to recruit other teens. Of course, minors cannot legally consent to sex. All in all, investigators turned up at least 80 underage victims. Importantly, prosecutors also found that some of the girls were given work with a Manhattan modeling agency, while they were also living in an apartment owned by Epstein. While a new indictment was prepared, prosecutors reported that Epstein's lawyers had been harassing the victims. However, Acosta was firmly in charge of the negotiations and agreed to give Epstein what can only be called the plea deal of a century. So let's talk about this non-prosecution agreement. Epstein pleaded guilty to a single count of solicitation of prostitution and a single count of prostitution with a minor under the age of 18. The court sentenced him to 18 months in jail and adjudicated him as a convicted sex offender. The agreement granted Epstein and incredibly his unindicted co-conspirators immunity from federal charges. This is unbelievably unusual. You don't give pleas to people that you haven't named in an indictment. The federal non-prosecution agreement was also marked by other things that were highly irregular and borderline unethical. For example, Epstein somehow managed to remove his computers from his main residence before the FBI was able to search the house. Secondly, although subpoenas were prepared for the computer records, law enforcement never required Epstein to comply with any of the subpoenas. And finally, although the plea negotiations typically include several Department of Justice lawyers, Allegedly, Acosta met with Epstein's lawyers one-on-one -on -one without any backup from the DOJ. The end result was a highly unusual, some would say disastrous, non-prosecution agreement that would only be made public more than 10 years later. In exchange for Epstein's guilty pleas to Florida's criminal solicitation charges, the Department of Justice agreed not to pursue criminal charges against Epstein for all of the other allegations. Acosta used his authority to lead prosecutors to drop all other investigations into Epstein's conduct. Further, it appears that Acosta agreed to hide the agreement from the victims and other witnesses in this case. He granted Epstein's unindicted co-conspirators and employees blanket immunity from prosecution. Some of these people were named and some were completely anonymous. Acosta also canceled the subpoenas, which is highly problematic. From the time the FBI started investigating to the time that the agreement was struck, the victims were never notified about a potential non-prosecution agreement, nor were they ever told that it was a possibility. In possibly the most unbelievable fact of this entire case is that after the agreement was signed, the government lawyers led by Acosta started negotiating on whether the government would even comply with the Crime Victims' Right Act, or CVRA. The purpose of the CVRA is to keep victims in the loop about the investigation and prosecution of criminal defendants. Certain victims have a right to know what's going on with a federal prosecution. And it appears that both the DOJ lawyers and Epstein's lawyers knew that there was a compliance requirement. However, one of Epstein's lawyers wrote an email directing Acosta not to have anyone from his office reach out to the victims in any way. After this email, Acosta then went out for breakfast with the Epstein lawyer, where he promised that the government would not in fact contact the victims. The agreement also gave Epstein unprecedented control over whether the victims could sue him in civil court. The agreement stipulated that Epstein's attorneys would be permitted to select the civil lawyers for each victim, and that Epstein would pay those lawyers and that he would not contest liability. The whole purpose of these agreements was to prevent any of the information from becoming public. Acosta also allowed Epstein to stipulate that paying off the victims was not an admission of guilt whatsoever. Acosta also agreed that if anyone requested public records under the state or federal Freedom of Information Acts, the government would notify Epstein before making the required disclosures. Thus, the deal made sure that Epstein's lawyers were always completely informed of what was going on, while the victims were completely in the dark. 
Epstein wasn't put in jail in the traditional sense. He spent his nights in a Florida jail, but during the day he was on work release where his private driver picked him up each day and drove him to his office downtown where Epstein was able to visit with friends and colleagues for 12 hours a day. Meanwhile, the victims were waging a legal battle to have the plea agreement unsealed. Epstein was released from jail five months early in 2009. Although Epstein's probation prohibited him from travel, the Miami Herald reports that Epstein regularly traveled between Florida, Manhattan, and the US Virgin Islands. I probably don't need to tell you that this is highly irregular. If any other criminal defendant had done this, they would have been sentenced for a probation violation. But Epstein continued life unscathed, even hanging out around the beach in Florida when he was supposed to be at the office. Epstein's probation officer said it was fine for Epstein to walk around the beach when he was supposed to be at work. He was allowed to get some exercise, according to the probation officer. Additionally, Epstein failed to register as a sex offender as required by the plea deal, which again, if any other criminal defendant had done that, they would have been subject to a probation violation. By late 2009, dozens of victims had filed civil lawsuits against Epstein. Meanwhile, Epstein's ex-butler, Alfredo Rodriguez, had possession of Epstein's little black book of important people and tried to sell it to enrich himself. Rodriguez was charged with obstruction of justice for not giving the black book to police. He served federal prison time and died in 2015. Now, convicted sex offenders are required to register in any jurisdiction where they live. Enter Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance. You may have heard of Cy Vance for his questionable handling of high-profile sexual assault cases, including allegations against Harvey Weinstein. But in 2010, a prosecutor from Vance's office appeared in New York State Court to argue that Epstein's sex offender classification should be reduced to a lower level so that he would have more freedom. I've never heard of this happening before. Prosecutors are not in the habit of telling judges to help sex offenders get a lower classification to crimes that they have already admitted to committing. Just listen to what the judge had to say. Quote, I have never seen the prosecutor's office do anything like this. I have done many cases, much less troubling than this one where prosecutors would never make a downward argument like this. Vance's office claims that one prosecutor made a rookie mistake and that he didn't even know that Epstein was appearing in New York court to argue about his sex offender classification. But that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. By this point in 2010, Epstein was a billionaire whose escapades had received considerable press attention. Epstein tried to rehabilitate his image in 2011 and 2012 by donating large sums of money and waging a PR campaign. However, in 2012, a woman named Virginia Roberts alleged that she was forced to have sex with lawyer Alan Dershowitz and Prince Andrew. Although victims and alleged victims continued to file civil lawsuits and fight for the Florida indictment to be unsealed, in 2016, Donald Trump was elected president. His connections to Epstein made mild headlines in June of 2016 when a woman going by the name of Katie Johnson said that the president had raped her at a party at Epstein's mansion in 1994 when she was 13 years old at the time. Trump and Epstein deny those allegations and the lawsuit never went anywhere uh, because 11 days before the election in 2016, Johnson dropped her lawsuit alleging that she had been threatened. Around the same time, shortly after the inauguration, President Trump nominated Alex Acosta to lead the Department of Labor. Although lawmakers briefly questioned Acosta about the Epstein affair, Acosta was confirmed. Flash forward to today. In 2019, victims finally won an important court battle. The 2006 Florida indictment was unsealed, revealing publicly for the first time how deeply involved in human trafficking Epstein appeared to be. Victims also won their lawsuit, alleging that Acosta's office had violated the Crime Victims' Rights Act by failing to notify them. Under the CVRA, victims have a right to be reasonably protected from their assailants, to be notified of any public court hearings in a timely fashion, to be informed in a timely manner of any plea bargain or deferred prosecution agreement, and to speak at any court hearing involving a plea deal or sentencing. Several victims sued in federal court, alleging that Acosta and the DOJ had failed to follow this law by keeping them in the dark about how the case with Epstein had progressed. Now, under the CVRA, a victim may make a motion to reopen a plea or sentence only if the victim has asserted the right to be heard before or during the proceeding at issue and such right was denied. The victim petitions the Court of Appeals for a written mandamus within 14 days. Uh, and in a case of a plea, the accused has not pled to the highest offense charged. The federal district court judge ruled the prosecutors had violated the CVRA by not letting the more than 30 identified victims know of the deal so that they could have a chance to oppose it. The judge ruled that the government gave deliberately misleading information to victims and promised Epstein's lawyers not to notify the victims of the plea deal. 
The judge ruled that the government led the victims to believe that the investigation and prosecution was ongoing when in fact the agreement had been signed and Epstein had already been sentenced. However, the judge did not reopen the plea deal. Instead, he gave the Department of Justice 15 days to come up with a settlement proposal. The DOJ argued that there was nothing wrong with how Acosta handled the case. It's against this legal backdrop that prosecutors in New York are taking aim at Epstein once again. The US Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York charged Epstein recently with child sex trafficking in violation of 18 USC 1591, which outlaws sex trafficking activities that affect interstate or foreign commerce. The new indictment refers back to the allegations in Florida, New York, and New Mexico that were the subject of the earlier agreement. And now, although those events happened between 2002 and 2006, there was no longer a statute of limitations for child trafficking cases. The statute of limitations was originally five years, but before Epstein's statute of limitations had run, lawmakers changed the rule so that there was no longer a statute of limitations for these particular cases, which means that Epstein will not be protected by any effective statute of limitations. Now, whether Epstein's original plea deal will protect him and give him immunity is a bit of an open question. Normal practice is to include a clause saying it only binds the local US Attorney's Office which signed the agreement, not any of the other US Attorney's Offices which may seek to press charges. But the plea agreement drafted by Acosta does not include this clause. This is of course incredibly unusual and highly irregular. Although Epstein's lawyers will surely try to argue from this broad language that the entire federal justice system cannot prosecute Epstein for the conduct occurring in Florida in the early 2000s, there's other language in the plea agreement, which more specifically says the prosecution cannot take place in a specific federal district. If this particular plea agreement is litigated, it's very likely that a judge would find in favor of the Department of Justice and find that this plea agreement does not bind every other US district. Epstein's alleged crimes took place in New York as well as Florida, so federal prosecutors in the New York district probably have the right to prosecute Epstein for the conduct that occurred in that district. As for concerns that prosecution on old allegations violate the double jeopardy clause of the US Constitution, the new indictment apparently includes crimes which were not charged in the older case, including Epstein bringing victims across state lines. There are also new factual allegations against Epstein as well. When the government searched Epstein's New York home, they allegedly seized hundreds of photographs of nude underage girls. The photos were kept on several CDs with labels such as girl pics nude. That's something that's so on the nose, you're not even going to see that in an episode of Law & Order SVU, but that's what happens when a criminal defendant thinks that they are immune from prosecution for the rest of their lives. So what happens next? Well, there are a number of unanswered questions. The first of which is what's going to happen to Jeffrey Epstein in the new prosecution in the Southern District of New York. Will the courts allow the old plea deal to provide any kind of immunity or will they just simply throw it out? Additionally, we don't know what the remedy for a violation of the CVRA is. Does that undo the plea agreement itself? Meanwhile, Acosta has argued that the evidence wasn't particularly strong at the time and that the Miami prosecutors had said that if the DOJ didn't get an admission of guilt from Epstein, that the prosecutors were simply going to let Epstein walk. So having the DOJ get the plea agreement that they did with jail time was better than nothing at all. But one thing is for certain, Alex Acosta is now out of a job. After a press conference where he heaped blame on victims and local Miami prosecutors for the Epstein non-prosecution agreement. Simply put, the Palm Beach State Attorney's Office was ready to let Epstein walk free, no jail time, nothing. Without the work of our prosecutors, Epstein would have gotten away with just that state charge. And, and as to a message to the victims, um, the message is you need to come forward. The writing was on the wall and Acosta had to go. Acosta resigned and President Trump defended him, stating, You know what I know about Alex? He was a great student at Harvard. He's Hispanic, which I, which I so admire, because maybe it was a little tougher for him and maybe not. But he did an unbelievable job as the Secretary of Labor. That's what I know about him. I know one thing. He did a great job. And and until this came up, there was never an ounce of problem with this very good man. What? 
Today, there is no witty remark or pithy segue. When I cover stories like these, it makes me want to do as much good for as many people as possible. If this video leaves you wanting to do some good in this world, I'd recommend Tab for a Cause, which lets you raise money for charity just by opening up tabs and browsing the internet, which you were going to do anyway. Tab for a Cause is a Google Chrome extension that allows you to pick the charity of your choice, and then every time you open up a new tab, instead of there being a blank page, it displays a beautiful new customizable tab with a couple of tiny ads. The money that you generate is then donated to your charity. The gorgeous new tab is customizable, and my favorite option is that it shows you how much you are generating for each specific charity. After you've opened up a tab or two, you can then choose the actual charity you want the money to go to. It's like a game, except you're actually changing the world that you live in. There's absolutely no charge to you, and it makes a positive difference in this world. Tab for a Cause users like you have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity. It is the easiest possible way to donate to charity and make the world a better place. So just click the link in the description and download the extension and do some good by doing what you were going to do anyway. Do you agree with my analysis? Did Acosta handle things correctly or was he right to resign his post? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this link over here with all of my other real law reviews where I cover everything that is going on in the world from a legal perspective. So click on the playlist and I'll see you in court.